So I fast forward to 20, 21st century, and what do you find? You get things like this, okay? This is in America. So now, what I find interesting is, is, the, is the level of passion that it requires to actually do it. You gotta like pay for this, okay? <laughs> and it means a lot of people pissed off at the Big Bang. They're pissed off at the Big Bang. At, at our museum in New York, the American Museum of Natural History, they come to the Big Bang exhibit, and sometimes I don't feel like having that conversation. I say, why don't you go to our hall of human biology first, and then come to us. And that's where we have sort of monkeys holding hands with people in skeleton forms, and then they never make it back to the Big Bang. <laughs> They're gone forever. <laughs> Okay, so however egregious the Big Bang is, monkeys and people is a, is, a worse agree, is, a, is a worse transgression, apparently. So there's that, but there's also, uh, here's a little bit of intelligent design here. Here's one that, that is, wants to accept the science, but then is like what's before the Big Bang. We don't quite know yet, so God was there. So, so of course, intelligent design is basically a god of the gaps. But my favorite way to end this then is to just reflect on, uh, I want to do it just a fast tirade on stupid design, and uh, this will be fast. Uh, look at all the things that just want to kill us, okay? Uh, most planet orbits are unstable, uh, star formation is completely inefficient, most places in the universe will kill life instantly, instantly. The people that say, oh, the forces of nature are just right for life, excuse me, <laughs> just look at the volume of the universe where you can't live. You will die instantly. That is not, that's, not, that's not what I call the Garden of Eden, all right? Uh, uh, galaxy orbits that we orbit once every couple hundred million years, you're bound to come close to a supernova that will wipe out your ozone layer and kill everybody on the surface who doesn't otherwise have dark skin because your high energy rays will give you skin cancer. Um, <laughs> We're on a collision course with the Andromeda galaxy. Gone is this beautiful spiral that we have. And, of course, we're on a one-way expanding universe as we wind down to oblivion, as the temperature of the universe asymptotically pro approaches absolute zero. That's the universe. Then Earth, volcanoes, a tsunami just killed, uh, you know, I think that number's higher, up 200,000 people, floods, tornadoes. None of this is any sign that there's a benevolent anything out there. And this 90% is, should be 99%, as was earlier noted. That's a... Um, of all life that has ever lived is now extinct. Inner solar system is a shooting gallery, comets, uh, uh, asteroids, duck. Um, and look how long it took to make multicellular life. Not from the beginning of the Earth. Life happened quickly, but not multicellular life. Uh, you needed your cyanobacteria to sort of crank on the oxygen, get the oxygen budget going. Then you could have sort of, uh, that's sort of rocket fuel for multicellular creatures. But that took three and a half billion years. That's hardly an efficient plan with us in mind. Um, and in human beings, this is like the most tragic of them. I don't even include here the expression of free will where people want to kill each other. I'm talking about nature killing us without the help of human beings. Aggressive childhood leukemia, hemophilia, all of this, all of this. And we so much praise about the human eye, but anyone who's seen the full breadth of the electromagnetic spectrum will recognize how blind we are. Okay, and part of that blindness means we can't see, we, we can't detect magnetic fields, ionizing radiation, radon. We are like sitting ducks for, for ionizing radiation. Um, we have to eat constantly because we're warm-blooded. Crocodile, eat a chicken a month, it's fine, okay? So we're always looking for food. These gases at the bottom, you can't smell them, taste them, you breathe them in, you're dead, okay? So I'm almost done, I'm sorry, I'm taking up your time here. So, so and with the birth defects, most others, we, it's like abuse and infection and stuff that human beings have something to do with. Here's, we have no idea. Oops, I pushed a button by accident, sorry. No idea. No idea. And, you know, and birth defects are tragic. They're tragic, particularly if they happen to the family afflicted by it. And you just look at images of these aborted feces because, um, uh, fetuses because of the, and most of these are still born. Others are born, you know, born with a heart outside the body. And so... This is all simply stupid design. And the problem is, if you look for what is intelligent, and yeah, you can find some things that are just really beautiful, and really, hey, that's a, that's a clever, you know, the ball socket of the shoulder, and a lot of things you can point to, but then you stop looking at all the things that confound that revelation. And so, so if I came upon a frozen waterfall, and it just struck me for all its beauty, I would then turn over the rock and try to find a millipede. Okay, or some kind of deadly newt, and then put that in context and realize, of course, the universe is not here 
for us, for any uh, uh, singular purpose. My favorite of all is, of course, you eat, breathe, eat, and drink through the same hole in your body, guaranteeing that some percent of, our, of us will choke to death every year, okay? Imagine if you had a separate hole for breathing and eating and talking. That would be just really cool, right? <laughs> it was just, you could drink, breathe, and just talk, and you would never choke, all right? And it's not, it's not a hard request. Dolphins breathe and eat through different holes in their body. And that's a mammal. So I'm not asking, I'm not, you know, this is like Santa Claus could bring this one. <laughs> um, and this one, of course, my favorite of all, like, what's this going on between our legs, right? As you've heard, like, it's, we have, and, and you've heard it. It's like an entertainment complex in the middle of a sewage system. No engineer would design that at all, ever. It's like the wrong juxta juxtaposition of elements. So what I want to put on the table is the fact that I don't want the religious person in the lab telling me that God is responsible for what it is they cannot discover. Because look at the hubris of that. You're in the lab, and you say, I don't know how this works. And not only that, no one alive on Earth knows how this works. And not only that, no one who will ever be born will know how this works. That's kind of audacious when you think about it. And then you put it down and go on to the next problem. This problem is a cure for Alzheimer's or, or cancer or whatever else. I don't want them in the science classroom. And so the issue is simply about progress and discovery. And in my recent forays into Washington, where I've been closer to a community of Republicans than I have ever been in my life, because I grew up in New York City, and in New York City, it's, I think that person is Republican back there. You see? The, <laughs> no, not that one. The one behind that person. Yeah, that's a Republican. <laughs> There's another one. That's in New York. That, so you grow up this way, and I get sort of baptized into a Republican administration. I had two consecutive appointments in the Bush administration, one on aerospace, on the aerospace industry, and one on uh, space exploration. The NASA's future, basically. And I realized something, spending that much time in the community of powerful Republicans, that Republicans, above all else, do not want to die poor. <laughs> so there's a limit to how far this will go. And I bet most people in this room, even those assembled at this table, were highly concerned about the Dover trial, wondering how that would turn. And I looked at that and I said, I'm not worried because it's a Republican judge. And in the end, if you put people who are not making discoveries in the science classroom, that is the end of the foundation of your future economy. And so I had a little more confidence than others did because of this uh, uh, sensitivity to the, the money aspect of it. But we all know tomorrow's economies will be founded on, uh, on, on innovations in science and technology, and of course that gets cut short if uh, we lose our civilization as what happened in Islam in 1100. And the last thought I'll leave you with, which concerns me greatly, if you do the math, okay, you know, just look, you look at all the Nobel Prize winners there ever were, some even in this room, and ask how many were Muslim? And it's like one, maybe two, okay? I, I think a second one was in economics. And the one we referred to was uh, an, uh, described earlier, the co-winner of the Nobel Prize with Professor Weinberg, uh, Abdul Salam. And he's not Middle Eastern Muslim, he's Pakistani Muslim. <clears throat> okay? Now, how many Nobel Prizes are won by Jews? It's like the fourth of the Nobel Prizes. Okay? Some high fraction of the total. And then you look, how many Muslims are there in the world? It's like a billion Muslims. How many Jews? 15 million tops. Okay? So you do ratio these numbers, had Islam not collapsed in its intellectual standing in the year 1100, and you just do the ratios, they would have every single Nobel Prize today. So the fact that it's not only just a few, it's near zero, it is deeply worrying. I'm concerned about what lost, what, 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 what brilliance may have expressed itself and did not in that community over the past thousand years. And so what I want to put on the table is why, so that's, that's the end of my talk, but I want to say, I want to put on the table not why 85% of the National Academy rejects God, I want to know why 15% don't. And that's really the, what we got to address here. Otherwise, the public is, is secondary to this. 
Thank you for your attention here.